Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship on the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Just a few points for us to reconsider, reflect upon as we begin our worship. You will find the paraments in green, something that you will find for a long time, and that is the longest period in the church calendar. Green signifies growth. For us to spend this time, Sundays after Pentecost, as a time of learning to be a faith community. What does it mean to be a believer and follower of Jesus Christ? Let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires know, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us.
love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
lesson is from the ninth chapter of Zechariah, verses 9 through 12. The coming Messianic king will inaugurate an era of disarmament and prosperity. Because of God's commitment with Israel, the people are designated as prisoners of hope. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow, bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from river to river, to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. Here is the reading. Our psalm today is Psalm 145, verses 8 through 15, found on page 286 in the front of your Bible. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone, and his compassion is over all his works. All your works praise you, O Lord. And your faithful servants bless you. They come in the glory of your kingdom and see of your power. That the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. The Lord is faithful in all his words, merciful in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all of those who fall. He gives us of those who are out. The second lesson is from Romans, chapter 7, verses 15 through 25. I do not understand my own actions, for I do, I do not know what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, Evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. Jesus said, 
I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. of 
Obedience to God's call. Obedience to discipleship. There will be turmoil. There will be challenges and difficulties. The cross is not just an incident when you follow Christ. According to the Gospel of Mark, it is saying, take up your cross daily and follow me. It is not once in a lifetime, once, just once for a few days or just on Sundays. This call to be disciples, to love that gift of eternal life comes from day one. From the very first moment Jesus begins his preaching. What we refer to as the Nazareth Manifesto. And we read about that in the Gospel according to Luke chapter 4 verses 16 to 21 on. But Jesus proclaims, chooses the passage from the prophet Isaiah and reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to liberate those who are oppressed, to set the prisoners free. And he identifies himself with this core message of salvation, liberation, and the gift of eternal life. When people like John the Baptist affirmed his call, the content of that call, and went about doing, preaching that good news, some of those listeners, especially those in power, did not like it. Because John the Baptist preached as he had to. That burning within oneself when you are built with that spirit of God. You cannot but speak the truth. That got him into trouble. John the Baptist was imprisoned. Jesus knew that John was behind bars. John himself wanted to check out if Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah. So John sends his disciples, are you the one who is to come? Jesus does not say yes or no. He simply says, go back and tell John what you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Do you see the content of the gospel? Go tell him. And it is in that context that Jesus teaches the crowd the meaning of teaching and preaching the gospel. The realities that prevail at any given time. You will never find the crowd at one location, in one perspective, one heart and mind, having just one opinion. And even in the days of Jesus, that is the case. When people wanted to find out who Jesus is, how do we brand him, how do we label him, how do we understand him, they found fault with Jesus because he was constantly surrounded by people who were labeled as sinners, tax collectors, synonymous with those with whom you do not want to keep company. If you recall those beautiful parables that Jesus taught that we read in the 15th chapter of Luke, which talks about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and that of the prodigal son. The first two verses in that 15th chapter goes like this. 
Then tax collectors and sinners came and they surrounded Jesus. But the Pharisees and those who were powerful asked the disciples, Why does your leader, why does Jesus keep company with these sinners? And it is in response to that question that Jesus tells those three parables. The society at any time is interested in branding and labeling communities and individuals, especially when they do not conform to what we identify as normal, good, best. And when we are constantly engaged and preoccupied with this labeling, branding, we forget the ultimate goal and expectation God has in and for each of us. We turn into judges. We are judgmental about many things in society. And we are so engrossed in these judgments and opinions that we often forget to see the mercy of God. Having been a professor for a long time, I'm tempted each time to give you homework. <laughs> Forgive me for that. It will be good if we go when we get back home to memorize the hymn. There is wideness in God's mercy. There is wideness in God's love. There's a kind of justice in God's mercy all interwoven together. It is we because of our narrow opinions that we would like to God, judge for God, and ask God to put people in the boxes that we would like. How beautiful it would be for us to realize at this moment, yes, God's ways of speaking to the world is in so many ways. So many ways and in using people, cultures, religions, opportunities for us to open our ears and eyes of our hearts to say what is going on around us. Can we listen and when we try to figure out, is that God's voice? Is that voice of life? Does that voice contribute to the affirmation of God's image in the other? If we identify ourselves, our priorities and principles and align those with the purpose with which God has created each one of us. Though difficult, it is possible to move closer, to inch closer to the heart of God. It is difficult, it is. It has a lot of challenges. When Paul, what we read in the second reading today, talks about this helplessness as a mortal, as a human being, I know that is good. But why is it that I'm not able to do it? I know that is wrong. And I still continue to engage in that sin. Help me, O oh God. For mortals, for us as human beings, to confess 
our vulnerabilities, our human limitations, is to acknowledge that at any given time, we as human beings cannot achieve to be good. God's grace is the only element of surprise in our everyday lives. What I refer to each time as any time grace, everyday grace, every moment grace, that is what helps us realize. Look for what we call the ultimate goals. What criteria do we look for? Through what lenses do we see people, actions, our own lives? How can we come closer together as a community? The moment we acknowledge our limitations, our vulnerabilities, is also a moment when we look for God's surprises, everyday surprises. The word of God today, especially in the gospel lesson, reminds us that very often it comes in unexpected ways, beyond human comprehension. What is hidden to those who are intelligent, who claim all knowledge and wisdom, is revealed to the infants, to the kids. They are not citizens of tomorrow. They are the leaders of today. Now, the meaning of life the purpose of why each one is created in this world, that gift of relationship, if they learn now, that is the best way we can help grow the church, help acknowledge that God has not given up on us. God's grace is still active every day, every day. The first reading today tells us of a hope. Imagine putting these two words together, that we become prisoners of hope. How do you become prisoners of hope? Kind of opposites put together. But that is exactly what we are. Rather than being put down, dismal, about the situations of today. The invitation is, look through the eyes of Jesus. Interpret our lives through the eyes of Jesus. And let us listen to that still small voice calling out to each one of us. Come unto me, all those who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. One little message that's included for the kids too. What we wear as the stole each time, there is a meaning. This is being yoked for Christ. Yoked for Christ, meaning you preach, you teach what God wants. So when we are yoked as those serving Christ for us all to be yoked together in this common mission and witness. May the big things that pass with all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. Amen.
our faith. I believe in God.
merciful God. We offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. We receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you. 
blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.